I've been here 42 years. It's been a long haul. And uh, I can't believe if somebody had told me when I first came here that I was going to be here 42 years, I would have laughed you off your, off your seat. <laughs> uh, it's amazing how one thing turns into another and um, God begins to move and, and we just keep on keeping on. And so that's, that's what's happened. And I have to say for me to be here um, and to experience all the things that I've experienced here is an amazing thing. It's been a great, great ride for me and um, as much as God has used me in this fellowship, the blessings that have come back on me, and I've been, I'm a blessed man today because of the faithfulness of God. God has been very, very faithful. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 3 beginning, it's, Paul says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you always offering prayer with joy, prayer with joy. That's a good way to pray, pray with joy. Offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. That means a lot to me as uh, we start to wind down because it helps us to understand that God is not just a starter. He just doesn't start something and then get busy on something else. But God starts, he's going to finish. God has started a work in you. God has started a work in me. And what he began in our lives, he's faithful to fulfill that as we turn our attention to him. It's been a great thing. And so I came here on December 1976. I'm going to have to read some of this if I'm ever going to get through it, okay? So be patient. I came from Elizabeth, New Jersey, where God had called me and used me in a, in a coffee house drop-in center called His Place in Elizabeth. And um, there were four years where there were so many things that were happening. From 1972 to 1976, it was a, it was a hippie generation. Remember the, the hippies? How many hippies are we here? Former hippies. <laughs> um, it was a crazy time. And uh, if you're around that time, you remember how crazy it was. Um, but God was shaking up that generation. This was a generation of people that didn't want to fit into any kind of establishment. They want to do their own thing. They want to abandon tradition and free sex and, and, and free drugs and, and just live for now. Now is what mattered. They didn't think about the future. But there was something happening back in 1970, in the 70s and late 60s. There was a stirring amongst that generation Although they were blowing their mind on, on drugs, although they were creating all kinds of havoc in our society, God was behind everything. God was moving on, in the background. And their lives were being shaken by, by the Lord. When teenagers were dissatisfied with the drugs, they were dissatisfied with their, their lifestyle and because what they were doing was not really satisfying their heart's desire. And so God was behind that and was shaking people. 
And so they found out, that, whole, that generation found out that God would satisfy them where the drugs could not satisfy them, where the free lifestyle would not satisfy. They found at the altar God was filling them up. As they, sit, as they sat and heard God's word, then God was filling them up with his word. God was filling them up in the spirit. It was happening on the east coast. It was happening on the west coast and all between. And so um, uh, they were drawn. They were drawn by the spirit. Um, that was what was happening up in the Evangelical Church in Elizabeth, where I was attending, as a, a part of the the coffee house. The coffee house was not a Starbucks; it was a drop-in center, and we shared the gospel with people who came in, and we gave them coffee. And uh, we had an amazing thing. All these kids were coming in, and we were ministering to them and helping them to find Christ, and it was an awesome time. The same thing was happening up in Elizabeth was happening here in Chestnut Assembly. God was moving down this area, and there were young people that were, they heard the voice of God, they were drawn by the Spirit. I think if we would ask um, some of the church leaders back then how all this happened, it was it was just God. I know my father had a six o'clock in the morning prayer meeting every morning, and I believe that God heard their cry of the hearts of the people and sovereignly began to move. Sovereignly began to move by his spirit, and young people were coming to Christ left and right. It was an amazing time. My father saw the change that was taking place in Vannin as the church was growing by leaps and bounds with young people who had never been to a church before and knew very little about church protocol. All they knew was their needs were being met at the altar and Bible study. It was an awesome, awesome time. And so as young people start to come in, this church, Chestnut Assembly, started a Bible school because we wanted to train them. We wanted to train the, the new people who were coming in. And so my father started this Bible school. Instead of sending them away to Bible uh, so a Bible school um, that was already functioning, he said, let's keep them in the church. Let's help them to grow. Let's pastor them as they're learning, and then we'll send them out. And so these young people became very adept at, with the word. They were growing. They were learning the Bible. They were learning ministry. And it was an awesome, awesome time. By the time I got here in 1976, the Bible school had kind of fallen apart. The enemy had crept in, had sown some bad seed, and so the students of the Bible school started to scatter them. By the time I got here in 1976, there was no Bible school. And there was confusion because of what had been, been happening and the bad seed that the enemy had been planting in their hearts. There was, uh, they were confused about so many things. And so when I came, it was a time of rebuilding. There was a remnant of those people that started to come back. There were a remnant of people who were wandering now. They had received Christ. They had been filled with the Holy Spirit. But there was something. They, they weren't steadfast. And so they would come together and, and share. I don't know how, how many of you were invited in 1976 but Vinyl was kind of 
kind of a not good place to live. We left from New York metropolitan uh, area. It was so much life. We came down to Vineland and it was very quiet. And the church was, was quiet, but there was rebuilding. And so my father and I worked together for about a year and a half. And there was a rebuilding. I did so, so much counseling back in those days. Sometimes I would come in in the morning and go through the whole day, one person after another. There needed to be encouraged, needed to be find solid ground on which to stand. And so, so much of my time was in counseling, helping people to grow and find themselves. When I came, the board members include Nick and Dolly La Rosa, Jerry Smith, John Bates, Rius Bell, I think Tom Russo was on the board then. And so very godly people that were had the, the mind of the spirit and they wanted to see things grow. And so it was a good it was a good board and we worked together and got so many things done. If I gave you the names of some people that were, were here, I would say the names of Bob and Kathy Wells. I would say Andy Robinson. I would say Alan and Bobby Shapiro. I would say Terry Gigenti. I would say Paul Baker, Devin Peterson in March, um, Steve S. Palmer, uh, Mike Jeffrey, um, John Wilhelm. They were all part of that 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 remnant of of Jesus people that had not left the faith. The, the faith. Uh, Mike went off to Bible school. Uh, John Wilhelm went off to Bible school. And some of them stayed. And so it was an awesome time. And so they maintained kind of an excitement in the church. Now I'm talking about the church down the street. And so this was the remnant of, of the Jesus people that made up church and assembly. Now the more um, established uh, people were people like Jim and Edna Tate, George Thomas, Ann Sersky, Gladys Sutton, Florence Allen, Leslie Miller, um, who's now Leslie Josephson, Kay Simeon, Don Breeden, they were the pillows. Those, these people were the pillars of the church at that time. And um, they actually held, held everything together. As God used them, as, uh, some of you, uh, your parents, uh, your mom was a part of that. And um, some of you are still here because you, you have maintained your walk with God. And and you establish yourself as a pillar in the church. God used you. You may not have felt as though you were all that important, but God was using the pillars, the ones that would spend time in prayer and kept things together. And I remember those that were here later on, Frank Dawkins came in Lillian, and some others uh, that that are here today. You've been here for a long time, but God used you. And I, as I look back, and I, as I was preparing this, I thought of different ones that God had used along the way. How God used you was a. Uh, uh, and those that were here to sustain the work of God. Chestnut started out as a home group, a Bible study in a home. That's how Chestnut began. And it grew. And by the time I was here, it was, it was well established. 
But thank God, we, we can thank God for those that that struck by the stuff during those early years and kept things going. It was a, a powerful thing. Um, Don Breeden was one of the elders here. Um, later on, Sharon Wayne Fosnetti would come. Bob and Mary Louise Bailey would come. Janet Serace. Pat Mannion, the staff pastors included um, Bill Greenlee, John Wilhelm, Joe Panzino, Mike Truitt, Jerry Denton, Myra Rivera, Preston Sensuolo, Tim, Tim DeZinzio, Paul Skull, and Tony, Tony Cotto. It was during this time that God was moving in that first decade that God was moving in a great way down at the old church. And we began our inner healing workshops then. People would, who had hurts on the inside, they were walking around and everything looked good. There were no broken bones, no sickness, but there were many hurts on the inside. And so inner healing came as a at a time when there was a lot of a lot of healing in the of the past, a lot of healing of memories, and some of you will remember the the inner healing workshops we used to do them Thursday, Friday night, and all day Saturday, and they were powerful, powerful times. It was uh, still there are people that have testimonies of inner healing where the Holy Spirit healed on the inside and restored people to him. It was an awesome, awesome time. Um, Bob and Mary Louise Bailey uh, became parents of the church. They, Mary Louise had a, a Bible study in, her, in their home, and Bob, who was an attorney, a uh, well-known attorney in town, Bob wanted to have nothing to do with it. So Mary Louise would have the woe songs in once a week, and they would have Bob Bob study. And so when they came in, Bob would leave. But one thing Bob could not do was run away from the Holy Spirit. And one Sunday morning, God spoke to him through a, a message in tongues and interpretation, and he had a vision of him as a little boy walking down a sawdust trail in an old Methodist camp meeting, gave his heart to the Lord. A divine, a divine time in Bob's life, and he was radically saved. I have a, um, I think, 36 volume set of pulpit commentaries in my office. And it's a good reference work. You know, if you're doing a study, you do grab a book and you study. Bob had this, that study at home. One time when I was visiting his home, I pulled out one of the volumes of the pulpit commentary, and all through the whole thing was yellow, was yellow highlighted. He'd gone through the whole thing and had and read and studied. That's how much he was uh, involved and turned his life around for Christ. The whole city knew that Bob was a Christian. All of his little clients knew that his life had been changed. And, and so he was becoming a big, big part of, of what was happening with them here. At the end of the first decade, we need more room to grow. Any addition to the building would have taken precious parking space. The experts said that when you are 80% full, you are full. We're there even though we started a, an early service. We started looking for land and for an architect. That began our journey to build this building. It was at the end of the first decade. God had blessed down the street. We have fantastic services. God was pouring out his spirit. 
We started Heaven's Gate, sell flames down there and fill the place. There was a tremendous move of God. And we need a, we, and so we built this and we said that we need a building three times what we had. And so we, we sought for an architect and we started making plans. The second ex, the decade was 1986 to 1996. And during that time was when we experienced great growth. God was moving in a great way and we're having a, a marvelous time. Um, starting the building program uh, caused us to um, kind of focus our attention on the work that had to be done. And so we're sitting in a place now that where God has, has blessed us in, in, a, in a great way. In the second decade, we built this building for the glory of God. We had a capital stewardship program. That's when somebody from the outside comes, we hired them to help us to raise the money for this building. And so in that capital stewardship program, um, the people that live there, they pledged $1,600,000 for this building. With the people that we had, we were blown away. Our people were so, so good. And so over a three year period, they were gonna give $1,600,000. And um, then I went to Century 21, and they recommended that we ask for $1,800,000 for the church down the street. And they said that South Jersey is going to open up and blossom. And great changes were coming to South Jersey. And, and so we would have no trouble selling that. Did I say that? We would have no trouble saying that? Selling it? <laughs> little, little did I know what was going to happen. Nick was offering his services as a construction manager. Nick was a part of his church. He had been building churches for 30 years. This building was going to be his last hurrah, his last time. He was getting up in age, and he was looking to retire. And so Nick said, Pastor, I will be the, the um, project manager. I won't charge you a dime. And of course, that will take the cost down. And so we had that advantage. We estimated the cost of this building would be under $3 million. Well under three. With Nick uh, giving his uh, services here, we thought, well, this, this will happen. It just so happened that as soon as we put the old building up for sale, the bottom fell out of the real estate market. Do you think God knew that that was going to happen? I wish he had told me. <laughs> but he didn't. It took me by surprise. And so we started asking 1.6 million. We came down to 1.4 million, 1.2 million, 1 million. Five years later, five years later, we sold that building for $470,000. took a huge chunk out of our budget for raising money for this church. So instead of having 1.8 million to, to use for this building, I had 470,000 to use for the building. But during that five years was a time when we were 
in the process of building um, um, It was on a hot August Sunday afternoon. Oh, it was hot. And we said, everybody come to church down there. Everybody come to church and, and bring a show. We're going to have a groundbreaking. And so everybody came to church with a shovel. How many How many of you hear them? And they brought their shovel and... Um, and when the service was over, we got on Chestnut Avenue and came down to this location. We had um, the outline of the, this building was here. We got around the, build, the whole building, and we had a ground breaking. It was a great day. We rejoiced because of what God was doing. This was, we were on the, on the march. We were on the march. God was moving in a great way, and we had a great beginning as we came on that hot August uh, Sunday, and we dug our feet in. Um, everything was going according to plan until Nick Lawson suffered a stroke. He was going to be my my construction manager. Nick had a stroke after we were getting the steel structure up and he was unable to do anything more with the project. Soon after that, we discovered that our architect of record went bankrupt and left us stranded. And so here I am now, the, the steel's all up. My construction manager has a stroke my architect of record goes bankrupt, and there was no turning back. We had bought the land. We we're still trying to sell the building, and um, and so we're worshiping down there, and um, there was no going back. We borrowed a mi one million dollars from MBA in Springfield. It was at 10% interest, and and, um, and we we got a construction loan to to work on the building, and so we spent we we dug into that million dollars and we used it to continue to build. But we knew that that um, even though money was coming in from the pledges was coming in dribs and drabs. And so I need more money. I went to MBA where we got our first million dollars. I said, I need more money to work on my church. And they said, uh, Pastor Snook, we gave you a million dollars. It's been hard for you to pay that back. We're not going to loan you any more money. And so now I've spent the million dollars that we had for the building. It was all enclosed. But I couldn't go forward and I couldn't go back. And so we, as a congregation, we're at a standstill. And we prayed and asked God to help us. And... Um, The storm clouds were gathering. The pressure was on. And um, at the same time, God was moving by his spirit. And behind the scenes, with all the negative stuff that was happening on the surface with Nick, Nick Stroke, with the architect, and um, was spending the money in the background, God was moving. And I remember one night that I, w I was studying at the, at the old church, I got a telephone call. <clears throat> and the man on the other end said, Pastor Snook. I said, yeah. He said, you don't know me. 
But God told me to call you. I said, what? He said, well, let me tell you my story. He said, God told me to give you a message for you. And so I got on the phone and I didn't, I never met you, so I didn't know your name. I got on information. I asked for the assembly in London. Well, the operator gave her the assembly of God on, on land of Savannah. And so he called that church and gave him my blessing. And um, he hung up the phone and the Lord on the inside of it was speaking and said, that's not what I told you to do. I told you to call the pastor in Vanden on Chester Avenue. And so he got back on the phone and asked the operator for the pastor of, 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 of the assembly on Chester Avenue. She finally gave her my name. So he, he began to share what God had given to him about the church. Not knowing anything, anything about us, he talked about our building program. He talked about the lack of money. He read my mail. Somebody I'd never met before on the phone read my mail and said, but God has not forgotten you. I was having some doubts. I was wondering at that time, I hope I was right in in building this building. I hope it was God. I had confidence before, but because everything was going so badly, I started questioning myself. And um, and but they get this encouraging word by saying, because God said, "Don't doubt that I am the one that has." started this project and you follow me and continue to follow me and that building will be will be done keep following keep your eyes on me and all the needs you have will, will be met and so i thought well let's go at night now and i got my in my small office down there, I had a hallelujah fit. Uh, God had, had spoken. God had spoken. I'd never heard a clearer voice from God as he spoke. It was awesome, awesome time. I'd like to say that at that time, everything turned around. But I'm sorry to say, things got worse. There's a funny thing about, about when God speaks to us. We can have a mountain drama experience where God gives us direction. It's just like Moses on the, on the top of the mountain when God gave him the, the law and the plans for the tabernacle. A mountain drama experience. I received from God. But when we when we get a word from the Lord, we think at that time when God gives a word, that's the time he's going to move. And so I expected things to turn around and things got worse. For the money, I, I was still in, in big trouble. I'd run out of money. We stopped building on this building. The people in the city were were driving by, and the, and the plywood was so dark, and it were the the scourge of the committee. Oh, look at those people! They've started something they couldn't finish. That pastor was trying to build his own kingdom, and he's taking the money and he's running. 
all kinds of stories went out. Things, things got worse. And then I got a letter from a pastor in Alabama. Alabama. Now this pastor had never been to New Jersey. But he sent me a letter through our district superintendent and he outlined everything that the man who had called me had said. This, this time, God put it in writing. And so I was being led by the Spirit. God was speaking, but things were not changing. And that was confusing to all of us on the board at that time. It was a, it was a tough time. Um, during the time of the, of the time when the storm clouds were were gathering, I received other confirmations from from pastors that I knew had gave me some encouraging words. But the one that topped it off was a lady from Oklahoma City who had been visiting her brother in Bridgeton and was out for a ride in Vernon. She drove by our church, which was a time turning dark because the plywood on the other side was being weather beaten. It looked pretty gloomy. If you drove by the, this building at that time, you would have shook your head. You'd say, oh, that, that poor church. It's so bad what happened with that church. And so everybody expected us to go under. And this lady was driving by, and she was a Christian lady. She called me and said, the Spirit of God leaped within me. I had to pull over to the side of the, of the, church, the, the street. And she said, my brother was not saved, so I went back to his house in Brishin, got along with God, and said, Lord, what's that all about? This is your history now. And the Lord said, all hell has broken out against that church being done. Because the devil knows, listen to this now, the devil knows when that building is finished, The control that the devil has in Vinden is going to be broken. The devil knows that, and so he's fighting tooth and nail for, for, for the building to not be finished. I didn't have any money. I didn't know where to go. And so everything seemed to be uh, against this church getting done. And so she said she went back to Oklahoma City. She belonged to Faith Assembly of God in Oklahoma City. Talked to her pastor. Her pastor said, you better call that pastor and tell him what God said to you. And so he was able to get my number. She called me at home and revealed her story. And she said, I've never, I, I've not met her since. I never met her. The only conversation I had with her was on the telephone. But she said, Pastor, somehow God's going to see you through this. Somehow God has got his hand on your church. And God is going to move on your church. And your church is going to be a a beacon light and that, that the whole area will be affected by the ministry of the church. And so uh, it was almost too much to bear. It was almost too much to hear that. Here I was getting all these words from the Lord on the one side that would make you uh, put you on the mountaintop. On the other side, Nothing is changing. It seems like we're at a standstill. 
And um, I called Springfield where I received my money and I said, either you people are going to have a half-finished church in Vinan or you're going to have to help me out with this, with money. And the, the general superintendent, Brother Trask, he said, no, Pastor, we do not want to have a friend church in Vernon. And so after more meetings, they finally decided to send somebody to us to help us get finished, a construction manager. And um, Foy and Cindy Vandenaiti came from, came from Minnesota. And he had been a builder and was giving himself to the church and was going and helping with building projects. And so the general superintendent sent him to help us out. They became God's gift to us. How many remember Foy and Cindy Vendanae? Oh, it was a great time. They didn't, they didn't rejoice. They were not happy to be here. They were only here because they were obedient to God, not because they wanted to be here. I could see the, the tire marks from, from Minnesota to, to New Jersey. They didn't want to come. We got them a place in Millville to stay, and um, they went to work. Along with that, the, spring, uh, the people at Springfield Gave them enough money to finish the building. This is where I'm going to end for today. They gave them a sum of money and they said, get those people in the church. And so um, they came and were able to get us in the, this floor, on the first floor only. And the city... They were anxious for us to get in. And so um, the city played ball with us and gave us a CO for the first floor only. So we could go into the offices, into the classrooms, and down to the nursery. But we couldn't go upstairs, only to work. And so in 1995, we moved in we had our first service the third January, third Sunday in January, 1995. By the time we moved in, there weren't enough people here. I did not need a new church. I could have fit in down the street fine with the people I had. People had left because they got discouraged. They said, oh, crazy man snook. He's got us into this mess and and they left. They went to another church that did not have a building program. And so I didn't need, need a new church. Here I am with 200 people in a church that, that sat a thousand on this floor. Um, when I got in, when we got in, I had a mortgage. I'm going to leave you with this. I had a mortgage. I was going to move in. In three years, I was not going to be debt free. The sale of the building and the $1.6 million from the people. Both streams dried up. When I moved in in 1995, I had a mortgage that I had to pay $20,000 a month. $20,000 a month. That's every month. That just got me in the building. 
the fellow from Minnesota that helped us get in said, Pastor, I'm glad we're finished with the building, but I don't know how you're going to be able to survive. There's no way that 200 people can satisfy a $20,000 mortgage. No way. That's so far beyond. I said, for you, God is not going to leave us now. And we struggled for two years. And every week we'd take the offering and pay certain people and then not pay. And I don't know how, but we never missed a payment. We never missed a $20,000 payment. That was an amazing miracle that took place. I'm telling you this story because I want you to know that God has his eye on church and assembly. And that as I leave, I know God is, is, his hand is upon his church. And as we may remain faithful to him, there's going to be a great breakthrough. And now on June 30th, I'm going to finish this story. I'm going to tell how God met that need of $20,000 a month. Actually, the number was $19,660. That number will always be in my mind. I'll, I'll never forget that. But how God brought us through that and how the Spirit of God began to move. Once we, once we put our trust in Him, that God broke the barrier. And I'm going to talk about how people started to come in. As we were obedient to Him, listen now. Listen. As we were obedient to Him, the blessings followed. And I believe that for every person here today. As we walk in obedience, there's no magic formula here. There's no magic wand. As we walk in obedience and do the bidding of God, the blessings of God begin to flow. And God, God stands by his word and miracles happen. And and um, and and God moves on us in a great, great way. Come. So, come next week. Come the rest of June, and then the last Sunday, I'm going to finish the story. Okay? Do we come back? Come on! Somebody give glory to God. Amen. That's all, Sam. Lord, we was, was sat at your table this morning and partaking of the bread and the wine. We have remembered the miracle of Calvary. We are mindful that the plans you made many, many thousands, thousands of years earlier, you accomplish it. Because you're not a God that just talks a good talk. You back up your word. And we're at a crossroads in our church. And we're here remembering the past blessings. We're here remembering the, the past troubles. But we're here to testify about the faithfulness of God. How you have been the center of church assembly. That 
out of our trouble, out of our wilderness experiences, we maintain a worship and we lift up, lifted up holy hands, whether it was down the street or here in this building, and worship you. And Lord, we lifted up your name and became a place of, of worship, a place where we learned how to worship through difficult times. Nobody would have known if they had come on Sunday morning what we're going through because we were on the victory. We walked in victory even though we did not have victory. We saw that as a church and individuals have seen it in, the, in their lives. And I pray, Lord, that you'll help us to continue as a church to focus our attention upon you as individuals are in their own wilderness time. I pray that they will be encouraged as they walk in obedience, as they walk according to your word, that your hand will be upon them. Encourage our hearts today, Lord. Go with us as we leave this place today. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for being here.